Hello and welcome to Ocean Calls, the Euronews podcast series in which we plunge into the issues making waves on our blue planet. I'm science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. If you missed our first episode, I recommend giving it a listen, as it's a big picture overview of the state of our oceans with renowned scientist Johan Rockström and British environmentalist George Monbiot. Today, we're talking about what's on your dinner plate, and at the end of this episode, I don't think you'll ever look at the products in the supermarket fish aisle in the same way ever again. Okay, so I'm just walking into one of France's biggest supermarket chains and I'm going to go and check out what's happening in the fish section. I like eating fish and I do try to eat sustainably. There's a lot of advice out there, but in a real-life situation, do I know how to make a good choice? Okay, well, I've got a load of um, trout here that claims to be organic. And this one has got a... MSC label on it. It doesn't say anything about where that tuna came from. And this one says that it came from Brittany and that it is made from a natural tuna. Well, that's good reassuring, isn't it? Rather than an unnatural tuna. Not sure that's necessarily very helpful. So today we're asking, is it okay to eat fish if you love the ocean? And joining me are Vanya Volpehorst, the European Campaign Director for Illegal Fishing and Transparency at Conservation Organisation Oceana, and Manuel Baranger, the Director of the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division at the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the United Nations. And as usual, at the end of our conversation, our regular feature, where a special guest will tell us more about their favourite ocean species. And this time, you'll hear from an Oscar-winning filmmaker called Luc Jacquet. Manuel Vanya, thanks very much for being with us on the Ocean Calls podcast. I'm going to start with a question you probably weren't expecting. Manuel, do you actually eat a lot of fish? And if so, what's your favourite? Yes, I eat a lot of fish, and my favorite fish is the fish of the day. So I regularly go to my fishmonger and ask him or her what is it that she has or he has uh, fresh, and that's what I normally eat. So I've got a lot to choose from. Vanya? Yes, I also um, do eat fish. Coming from the Netherlands, I grew up with eating uh, mostly flatfish. So we eat a lot of sole, um, and also kids are sort of trained from the start how to debone a fish. Um, so I'm very proud of my skills. I stopped eating fish for a while, but I couldn't manage because I really love eating uh, seafood. So I also try to eat sustainable and uh, local seafood products indeed. And do you ever go fishing? It's important, I think, as a person working in an environmental organization to know how it is on the ground. So I joined a, a 10-day fishing trip in Scotland on a trawler um, fishing for haddock. I first got all my degrees, how to be able uh, to work on a fishing vessel if they if they took women on board. So I did that and actually was gutting haddock for uh, for ten days. I was first allowed to gut it manually, but I was not fast enough, so they put me on the on the machine. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because I, I always have a lot of respect for people that are involved in fisheries and have experience in fish on fishing boats. And, you know, I, I started my career as a fisheries observer in the high seas fleet. And I spent many, many months, uninterrupted months at sea. And it's only when you spend that amount of time at sea with fishermen that you realize how tough the profession is, how unique it is. And you get to think about the problems of fishing from a completely different perspective. The other thing is that you realize that fishermen love the sea and love the fish. Uh, they are not there to destroy and, and damage. It is a fantastic experience, and I think that it changes your life if you spend time not seeing land for a significant period. I read labels on products promising transparency, traceability, sustainability, lots of different buzzwords. And what I've learned preparing this podcast is that there are lots of problems with things like bycatch, with unwanted fish being thrown away by fishing boats. There's overfishing, there's illegal fishing. I've also learned about the globalized nature of the fish and seafood industries. The fact that I could be sitting on a port in Spain eating shrimp that was farmed in Southeast Asia or mussels from New Zealand. And when I open up a can of tuna, what's inside 
may have been caught on different boats in different parts of the world. And I'm wondering, Manuel, how did we end up in this situation? Well, I think that um, you, you're painting it as if it was a problem in itself. Uh, and I don't see it as a problem. I mean, what we've seen is that fisheries and aquaculture, because we mustn't disentangle too much the two, it used to be very small. In the 1960s, we were eating all, uh, each one of us nine kilograms of fish per person per year. And now we are consuming more than 20 kilograms per person per year, despite the population growth in that period. And as a result of that, the industry has become more efficient, more professional, and also trade has increased. So now about 40% of the fish that we catch is internationally traded, and it provides a lot of income. And in fact, for developing countries, the net revenue of fish export exceeds the net revenue that those countries gain from all other agricultural trade. Vanya, what do you think? Is this kind of globalised fish industry actually a problem or is it just a sign of a mature market like Manuel is saying? I think it really depends on the, the checks and balances that you put in place. So EU is actually the largest seafood market in the world. Uh, we are importing in Europe almost 60% of, of the fish consumed. It really comes with a responsibility to make sure that those products that are consumed and sort of globalised and traded all over the world don't have a, a background of illegal fishing or, or forced labor. So I think this is really key. You can have a globalized market that functions, that actually helps stocks recover globally, but that needs to that comes with national and international policy that actually aims to, to have sustainable fishing. And that's currently not the case. Did you know that only seven countries catch 50% of the world's fish. That's China, Indonesia, Peru, India, Russia, the US and Vietnam. What would you say would be the useful information we're already giving to consumers? Because I started by talking about some of the labelling that I see, and some of it is a bit vague. It'll say things like, OK, this was filleted by hand, but it won't say by who or where. What is the useful information we're already giving to consumers when it comes to products that they can see in the supermarket? Well, I think that um, first we're in, in almost connecting to the previous question. One has to understand that the term fisheries covers a very diverse um, type of operations. Uh, for example, hake in the high seas or in the uh, territorial waters of some countries where it is processed on board, it is frozen, it is prepared, processed, packaged, and it arrives frozen already, ready to distribute into the market. And that has a very clear sort of labeling where it's been caught in the region and so on and so forth. Then you have products that arrive fresh on to land and they are either sold fresh or then they're going through a new production process. And the, that production process includes perhaps transferring uh, the catch to one country to process in some way. And then from there, it's traded to another country for the consumer. And what is important is to have traceability. The, the FAO, for example, has been negotiating with countries uh, what we call guidelines for catch documentation schemes that allow the countries to ensure that there is a clear traceability, particularly when fish moves from one country to another, so that you know exactly through the value chain what has happened to that fish. Vanya, what could we be telling consumers more? Yeah, I really think it's, it depends sort of where you're from. Of course, knowing the most about Europe, I would, would start there. As Manuel mentioned, if you have a fresh fish that's, for example, bought in a supermarket or a fishmonger, there's a requirement for any product on the European market that there's a species name, where it was caught and how it was caught. But unfortunately, this is not required, for example, for tuna cans. So for tuna cans, the species name is not required. So for in some EU countries, it can be up to 10 or 8 different types of tuna that can be called tuna. So in the end, you have no idea what kind of fish you're eating, if you're eating an overfished species or if you're eating a well-managed species. So could I be eating an illegally caught fish like tuna or an endangered tuna and actually have no idea? Definitely, yes, definitely. What is important, first of all, is to understand sustainability, right? Because we want to make sure that the fish that we eat is as sustainable as it can. You know, the majority of the tuna that you will see in a can uh, is skipjack. And skipjack is one of the most sustainable resources we have. And we say that uh, one in three fish stocks is overfished. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's disappearing. It's just it's overfished. You are, to give an example, if you have money in the bank and the bank gives you 5% interest on that money, is that you are extracting every year more than that 5%. So you, you're getting more that, than the interest you're eating into the capital. So one in three uh, are overfished. 
two in three are not, of course. Um, that's important to recognize too. But that is all stocks being equal, regardless of the volume of fish that they produce. So if you weigh this by the amount of fish that these fish stocks produce, we say that 80% of the fish that arrives to the market is from sustainable stocks. 20% is not. That's an average around the world. So if you apply this to your to your circumstances, there is a chance, a 20% chance that when you get to the market, some of the fish that you'll see would be from overfish stocks. And uh, that is a problem. Vanya, I mean, everybody agrees that we want to have transparency. We want traceability. We want to have the best products on the table at the end of the day. The EU says it's trying to build a system to make that happen. What would you say from your point of view at Oceana? What are they doing well? What's working? What isn't? It cannot be sort of the responsibility of the consumer to know if a product is sustainable. Indeed, it should be the authorities. And currently, there's a couple of stocks that you can know that are managed sustainable because there's scientific advice, there's actually catch limits. But it is very difficult for a consumer currently to know where a product was coming from. So there is sort of cash areas in the world that the European Union uses to designate where a product is coming from. But it's very difficult. Even me, having worked on this for 10 years, I don't know them from the top of my head. Actually, we're asking now that there is a new law being made in the EU on that actually deals with traceability. We want also if there if it was caught in the national areas of a, a certain country on the high seas or if it was caught in this regional fisheries management organizations, which manage certain type of species and certain parts of the, the world's oceans. So they are thinking about it currently in the EU to make some type of criteria. They're not sure what it will look like, but it would be judging on environmental and social sustainability. So we really encourage the EU to be bold here and to actually have this type of information based on international criteria, because it would also count for imports, at least to have some type of information to the consumer, because this doesn't exist currently. Of course, the consumer has a very significant power. But what is more important is for the consumer to have confidence in the system that manages those fisheries. Am I confident with how this is going? Do they have a scientific process behind? Is the scientific process and the results respected? And if that is the case, then you can arrive to the market with a much more um, positive approach. But Manuel, you were talking about confidence. What's your level of confidence in the system at the moment? When we, we look at individual countries or individual regions, you see, for example, 93% of fish stocks in the US are not overfished. In Australia and New Zealand, is uh, over 80%. In the European system, the Atlantic side of the European system is about 57% of stocks are not overfished. So we, we know what regions work and what regions do not work. And why is that? Because sustainability is difficult. I mean, this, this is something that we need to acknowledge. It is not that easy to make things sustainable, particularly in places that are dominated by hunger, poverty, and political instability. Managing resources sustainably is expensive. And so sometimes when we see failures of sustainability, it's not because countries don't want to make things sustainable, it's that it is difficult and it requires money and there are priorities and they have to balance those priorities. Yeah, and one of the things that is also, of course, important to know is that if you do manage to rebuild fish stocks and you manage to sustainably manage a, a fishery, it actually benefits the fleet a lot. So if you see sort of the difference with the Northeast Atlantic, which is an area we've been using as an example in the Europe, the fleet was marginally profitable in 2003 when they started sort of following more the scientific advice. And if you look at it now, this, the fleet is actually very profitable. But if you talk about sort of consumer confidence and knowing what you get on your plate in Europe, you cannot deny that the Mediterranean Sea is still 75% overfished. I'm really pleased that you brought up the Mediterranean because that's been a bit of a surprise to me. The situation in the Northeast Atlantic has definitely improved, basically thanks to regulations from the 90s, 2000s onwards. But the Mediterranean is a kind of worst case scenario at the moment because there are some people who are regulated, others that aren't. You've got a huge difference in wealth between the North and the South. What would you say to a consumer? Would, should they actually avoid products from the Mediterranean in general because you can't consider that they're going to be sustainable? No, I, I wouldn't do that at all uh, because I think that in, in so doing, what you're doing as well is you're damaging an enormous amount of communities that depend uh, on fishing and have no other income and no other source of jobs and livelihoods than fishing. What we need and is actually what we are doing is putting a lot of effort in improving the sustainability of the Mediterranean fish stocks. So we have a general fisheries commission for the Mediterranean that has all the countries uh, repairing the Mediterranean and Black Sea as members. 
and they are working together in trying to set up principles of management. And as a result, the fishing effort in the Mediterranean has been decreasing over the last uh, few years, the recent years. So the sustainability is not yet showing those signs of improvement because it needs time to rebuild. But that is the way. And what do you think, Vanya? Indeed, there need to be enough closed areas or no troll areas or how to protect the habitat that's there that needs to be protected. But then also they really need to be implemented, right? So even the EU states that have closed certain areas are not monitoring it well. So we have cases uh, of Italy where you can't troll, but still we see uh, using vessel tracking, you see trawlers fishing there. So really there's a, a lack of implementation that is also coming from the EU who should actually do much more and has a very big responsibility also. One important area of the Mediterranean is the small scale fishers and they're a big part of the income, but actually don't catch a lot of the catches. So it's 30%, 30% I think, a recent FAO estimate. So it's also really important to make sure that small scale fishers who usually have a shorter uh, supply chain and also who provide employment get the catch limits that they should have to be profitable and also that they are supported by, by their governments. Did you know that the FAO's Area Code 27, the Northeast Atlantic close to Europe, is classed as one of the top five best managed fishing areas in the world? And you'll see that area code on fish product labels in the supermarket. So there's this legislation moving slowly along to get CCTV installed on smaller boats to basically understand what's being caught, what's being thrown away at sea that shouldn't be, to have more GPS monitoring. What's slowing down the rollout of that technology at the moment? Many of the small scale vessels, at least in Europe, don't have a VMS tracker. So a vessel monitoring system actually goes to the, the authorities, so it's not publicly available. And this is so it's proprietary information. It will never be in the public sphere because fishers are actually often very concerned that their competitors see what they, where they're fishing. So this is not an issue with vessel monitoring systems. And we've actually seen in areas where, for example, in Andalusia, where they piloted it voluntarily, it really benefits fishers because they get information on where they should fish at what time, and actually what species are more profitable, how, when they should bring it to market. So when it's installed, it actually benefits fishers also for the safety. As I said, the EU is currently revising its control regulation, which would require, if it's not blocked by member states, it would require vessel tracking for all vessels. So we really want this to happen. Then on cameras, it's a different issue because currently they're trying to install that to monitor discards. So it's unlikely that it will be small-scale vessels. It's mostly more trawlers that have a, a higher risk at uh, discarding fish. So here we also ask for at least all the high-risk vessels should have cameras on board to pilot this and also to start having more control at sea. I want to also mention, even though we are talking particularly about the European context, that from an FAO context, looking at the, around the world, we want to make sure that in encouraging these sort of processes, we don't end up blocking the options for trade from developing country operators that do not have the capacity, the financial capacity to actually implement systems that may be expected in other parts of the world. It is very reassuring for a consumer to see a stamp on a product that has a certification of sustainability, for example. But those certifications are very expensive and they are very data intensive. And so there are many producers in developing regions that may be very sustainable in the production, but they cannot afford that level of certification. To what extent is it more sustainable to eat farmed fish rather than fish that was caught in the wild? Well, I mean, first I would say that if you are fishing sustainable stocks, that is the best nature-based solution because fishing sustainably a fish stock, you are using essentially the production capacity of the ocean and you scheme essentially the interest of that capital and that is maintained over time. You don't have to feed that fish. You don't have to provide water. They require very limited energy. Of course, you have to send the, the fishing vessel there. It is economically and ecologically a, a very efficient system of producing food, much more efficient than any other food system on earth, on land as well. Aquaculture can be extremely efficient and very useful. And a lot of it, it can be 
incredibly uh, environmentally friendly. So for example, mussels or clams, oysters, then not only you don't feed them, they actually clean the water. So it's a very, very efficient system. And you have other systems that are uh, more environmentally unfriendly, depending on what mechanisms you use for feeding, for, for running, for energy, and so on and so forth. I think aquaculture is increasingly sustainable, increasingly innovative, and increasingly part of the solution to feed a growing population that is going to reach 10 billion in just a couple of decades, and all of them have a right to eat. From Oceana's side, we really think that it's more uh, wild capture fishery that can be the solution. Aquaculture, we still consider as, of course, this also comes with all the caveats that are there. It depends, sort of, as, as Manuel said, what type of aquaculture and where it's done and how it's done. But most aquaculture that uses smaller species to regenerate the product, that's where we have issues because we've also seen that it can cause pollution, it can cause escape, so invasive species. And it's also still the, the feed conversion is, is not as good as wild fisheries. I'm going to wrap things up now, but I just want to go back to, I suppose, to the consumer point of view, just to conclude. What would be the tips that you would offer to the consumers here in Europe when they're going around the fish aisle in their local supermarket or they're going to the fishmonger? What should they be looking out for? Yes, maybe three things indeed. So it should not be on the consumer to know if a product is sustainable. Given sort of the current lack of any type of information on if a product is sustainable, we would ask consumers to really look if there's information on how it was caught, where it was caught, and also to try to eat as locally as possible in terms of sort of how it was caught. We would have preference for gear that don't interfere with the seabed as much as bottom trotting, for example. So we would advise people to look, for example, to point in line or catches that are done with hooks. And then also we really ask to look at, is this coming from a fishery that's sustainable, even if it's very difficult for consumers to do. So maybe educate yourself a bit. If it's, for example, scrapjack, this is something that you can consume responsibly. If it's a yellowfin tuna from the Indian Ocean, you should maybe be a bit more cautious. So these type of things can be done. It requires a bit of digging, but it's worth it until there's a, a label available. What I would say is two things. I mean, first of all, to ask your fishmonger to have a relationship with whoever you buy the fish from. They know the best. And if you do that on a regular basis, you would see what arrives on deck, which is different every day. And you eat the freshest product. As we are more affected by climate change, there will be a change in the species that arrive on deck. You know, And we have to also support the community in adapting to those changes. The second is, again, to build the confidence on the consumer and on the systems that manage fisheries in your country. Be informed and know that in places where management is in place, sustainability tends to improve. There's been always in the media, just for example, comments about tuna, you know, and Vanya has made reference to that. Tunas in general are not more overexploited than all the other species. And the most caught tuna, uh, skipjack, is the, one of the most sustainable in the world. But even because of good management, there have been four species of tuna that were previously endangered that last year were removed from the endangered lists of the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So we are making inroads into sustainability. We are being successful and the consumer needs to be aware of that. OK, finally, simple yes or no question. In your opinion, is it OK to eat fish if you love the ocean? Yes. I think it would be a crime not to. <laughs> Vanya and Manuel, thanks very much for joining us here on Ocean Calls. It's been fantastic talking to you. And just before we wrap up our episode, I'd like you to meet an Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker who knows quite a lot about one of the ocean's most sociable and friendly creatures. Yes, hello, my name is Luc Jacquet. I'm a film director, making mostly film on nature. And I'm well known with one of my films named March of the Penguins. You probably expect me to say that the penguins are my favorite animal, but I, I don't like to choose among the, the wild animals, but for sure they are very important in my life. My very first rendezvous with the penguins, it was in uh, 1991. And at that time I was biologist and I, uh, I was on the way to spend a winter 
on a French scientific station named Nibonneville. When you see your penguins, you can see that, okay, now I'm sure I'm in Antarctica. I had this huge privilege to spend a full year very close to an emperor penguin's colony. This space is so paradoxical because they are so clumsy when they are working, but they are so impressive when they are swimming. And the shift is made in less than one second because they jump in the water and pff, this is another animal ready. This is a this is a rocket. Two, one. We have a Maybe the most impressive thing is their beauty. How their amazing legs are made, uh, the feathers, the beak. You have also the feeling to be accepted. As a human, this is not so common in this planet to be accepted by a wild animal. If they see you on the ice, they are going to come to see you, who you are, and like ask you, who are you, guy? They stay for a while, and after that, they leave you and they go just to make their own life. And for me, the most impressive thing is how do they manage to stay alive? When the conditions are so tough, are so hard, you have no other option to stay together and help the community. It's interesting to see that you have to go so deep in the extreme world to learn this lesson. I'm not thinking about them all the time, but after a period of time, month or year, I feel, ah, oh, they miss me. I really want to go down there again. I'm actually making a film about the Antarctic addiction because this is a place in the world which is paradoxically very addictive, and I'm unfortunately very addict of Antarctica. The Ocean Calls podcast is created by ocean lovers here at Euronews for ocean fans around the world. I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes, and this series is produced by my colleagues Naira Davlashian and Natalia Olsner. Editing is by Laurie Martinez and Chiara Santella from Studio Ochenta. The theme music is by Gabriel Del Masso. Our editor-in-chief is Sophie Claudet. If you want to find out more about Manuel Baranger's work, find him on Twitter on at Manu underscore FAO. For Vanya Volperhorst, visit at the Volperhorst or go to at Oceana Europe. For more from Luke Jacquet, filmmaker and co-founder of Icebreaker Studios, go to at Luke underscore Jacquet. The podcast Ocean Calls is made possible by the European Commission's DG Mare. You can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, CastBox or anywhere else you listen to your podcasts. If you like the podcast, please give us a five-star rating, comment and tell your friends. Your help makes spreading the word about the ocean so much easier. If you want our team to read your comments on social media, use the hashtag OceanCalls. Looking for something else to listen to? Check out another Euronews podcast called Cry Like a Boy, exploring centuries-old gender stereotypes and how men in some African countries are helping to find them. For more information on Ocean Calls, go to our website, euronews.com. And a special shout-out to Ocean, a Euronews TV series created by my friend and colleague Dennis Lottier, which is so good I am very jealous. Have a look on euronews.com slash ocean. Follow World News from a European perspective on euronews.com. Euronews.